And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and I've got my good brother, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, good brother Xanatrix, here with me. Yo! It is September 26th. The weather is starting to cool off a, a little bit. Um, and I and I I had to de- I had to deal with a bit I had to deal with a tiny bit of hail when I was when I was on my bike, which um that was enough to get me to say, yeah, time to pack it in. <laughs> get a stationary uh, stand for it, and you can still use the bike inside. Mm-hmm. I might, I might, end, I might end up doing that once it starts getting cold. Yep. Um. The only, pro- the only problem, the only um, the only pro, the only problem is I'm gonna miss hitting those inclines. Yeah. Uh, unless it's an unless you had an actual electrical exercise bike that can simulate that sort of thing. And even then, it only simulates it by increasing resistance rather than inclining you. It's not the same. Yeah. Um, although when I when I did a um, when I did a look up for sta- for stationary bike stands, I see that um, there it looks like there are some that do ha- that do have resistance. Um, it's not going to break the bank as much as I thought it was going to. So that's a, so that's a positive. Usually the bike that breaks the bank. <laughs> Most good bikes are uh, for people your your size and mine are pretty expensive. Just get just getting this one fixed costs me like costs me like four hundred bucks. Jeez. Oh. Yeah, I have to look into a titanium frame bicycle, so you know that's like a seven hundred dollar investment. Mm-hmm. Um. But I've I've had that I've had this particular one since the early two thousands, so. Me getting rid of this would be like Luci- would be like Lucille get um being dropped by BB King. <laughs> yeah. That yep. that ain't happening. Yep. Got to keep got to keep the partners. Mm-hmm. Um. Now the the uh, review the review for Savage Kingdoms is going to be a bit late. I'm probably not going to get that fully done until Monday. I'm hoping that I can get back to a Saturday focused review schedule before. Um, after that, it's just that a lot of stuff happened that, um, slowed things down a little bit. Um. Life happens, Monk. We all understand. Yeah. Now, with that said, let's get started with the Kickstarter spotlight. And the first one that we have is Perthro. I'm hoping I got that pronounced right. This is described as a Norse-inspired dice game for two players. And this is... That? Go ahead. Sounds very. Is it, it? It's just a dice game. It's it's a, like it's an actual gaming game. One you would use for games of chance and. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um. So when playing Perthra, you bend fate and luck to your will and try to outplay your opponent. The goal is to get all, is to gather all re- runes to spell weird before your opponent does. The web of weird. Depicts the connection between past, present, and future. The way you balance your luck and attempt to challenge your fate throughout the game will lead to your victory over your opponent. Do you love games? Do you like Vikings and Norse-themed accessories? Then you won't want to miss out on this. That second question is kind of a given, given you. (laughs) Um, Let's see. Despite being made out of runes, the rules are are simple and you can learn how to play it within the first few rolls. It's a very... The Norse part of it aside, this feels like a very beer and pretzel kind of game. Yeah, it's a, and it feels like a game that at a tavern, you know, the Vikings would play and bet each other's spoils. Mm-hmm. It was just my fate that I took your loot. That's all. That, that's all they'd say. Yeah, and then and then and then after that, somebody accuses somebody else of cheating, and then the fighting starts. You know. Just another Saturday night for any Viking. Mm-hmm. Um, and, besi- and besides, P- 
Pirates got liar's dice, so why not? Exactly. Um, so each player takes six dice of a single color. You and your opponent roll your dice in turn until a player has placed four of their six dice on all four runes on the game mat. The first player to do this wins. After you roll your dice, check if you have any combinations. You can't split any combinations, i.e. a triple cannot be split into a single and double. Dice that were used as part of a combination must be set aside for the rest of your current turn. Once all combinations have been used, the turn passes to your opponent. Um, all right. So double, double runes means you can place um, that rune on the mat. A spiral means you can re means you can re-roll um, dice, including the spiral. Double spirals, I get, I guess, are um, jokers, so you can create any si any um, symbol. Any triple, place any rune on, on the mat. Um, Gugnir, you can attack an opponent's die on the mat. You can only do that if you and your opponent have both placed that rune on the mat. Both players roll the die. The highest result wins. Spirals are zero. Gugnir is, fi is five. And r runes have their value marked on them. You get a double Gugnir. And you can remove one of your opponent's dice that shares a rune with one of yours. And an alternative condition is weird. If the first roll of the turn is with exactly four dice and you roll one of each rune on that mat, you instantly win. <laughs> I get the feeling that's it. that's that that may be an optional rule, but I get the feeling that even that even if it wasn't, the odds of that would be very, very rare. Yeah, the odds of getting one of of each of the four non-spiral, non-gunier runes mm -hmm. is astronomically high. So, especially with only four dice. So let's let's see. We've got d sixes for this. Um, four of them are obviously going to be rune faces. One's for the spiral, and one's for um gun and one's um for um gunier. Oh, two, two. I should, I should say, are for Gunier because of the two runes that make that up. But, yeah, but if we think of it as nor as normal dice pips, they'd both be sixes. Yeah. So you're trying to roll two through five, two, three, four, five on four dice without hitting one or six and without getting any any copies, essentially. If you were to estimate the probability of that, what would you say, like one in twelve hundred? I'd say my. A lot higher because you're going for a very specific combination and you're rolling all at once. It's not like rolling each die in a row so it's not the same probability compounding. It's all those probabilities multiplicatively. Which makes sense. Um, let's see. Two players, eight and up, five to ten minutes gameplay on average. And will be available in English, French, Sweden, <laughs> sorry, German, Swedish... Polish, Italian, Dutch, and Spanish. And they're working on Portuguese as well. But not Norwegian? As in the place where runes and the Norse came from? Well, uh, they did they did say that if somebody wants to sub if somebody wants to submit a rules translation, then shoot them a line. Oh, uh, well, I should someone should should uh, contact their Viking buddies in Norway and be like, yo, you need to give them a, Nor a Norwegian translation. <laughs> Um, so apparently this is based on the room per Perthro, Perthro, which is believed to stand for Dice Cup. Now, the <laughs> lack of a original Norse dice game led him to create one. This is not historical, but loosely inspired by Norse mythology and uses those themes. This is not his first rodeo. Previously, he had made VI, a strategic war game set during the Roman Empire. So he's going from doing the Romans to doing the Vikings. I mean, one did kind of trounce the other in Britain, so... Mm -hmm. Let's see, then stretch goals, each will... It looks like he doesn't have a whole lot... He's not aiming for a whole lot when it comes to stretch goals. The main one is this um, double-sided coin, which... I think on one hand is the weird, and on the other hand is Yggdrasil. That would be cool. At least that's what. At least I think that's supposed to be Yggdrasil on that. On that. 
I don't see a reason why it wouldn't be, and I can't think of any... And when I think of a giant tree in Norse mythology, of course, that's what's going to come to mind. A, di a giant tree with nine roots and branches combined. Mm -hmm. uh, and upon yeah. all of them... I up. am very strongly tempted on, on this one. But I will give him congratulations for getting funded within one day. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that that reminds me, just a small small spotlight because you did have them on the on the monastery recently. Mm -hmm. um, I I I kickstarted Light Strikers for hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> um, well, I I um I. I definitely appreciate that. I definitely appreciate that. It's a bit of an amusing coincidence since um, Light Strikers ended up um, commenting on day twenty six of RPG a day. Nice. Um, and even no matter how no matter how that turns out, I get the feeling that we have not seen the last of him. <laughs> I sincerely hope it gets funded. It's over two thousand now, so. Mm -hmm. So, hang on. So, next is Heavenscape Exordia. A player-driven narr narrative tabletop experience across the multiverse. They're asking for 1,000. They've got 11 days to go. They're at 473. Mm. They might, depending on yep. whether this can be pushed. Yeah, so apparently this is something that they've been building from the ground up for the last year, um, doing stories and delivering them through their podcast as well as their uh, World Anvil page. Nice. And as they grew their multiverse, they realized that, w that they needed a unique system that could match it. Changing systems from campaign to campaign made it difficult to bring back legacy characters and match their capabilities. Yeah, that sounds like the Rifts problem all over again. Oh, God, don't get me started on Rifts. Um, so, uh, so as far as what you'll need to play, this is the system itself features each dice from a D4 to a D100. It is set up to utilize the percentile die for resolving actions taken in a roll under style system. The other die are used as counters for effects, countdown timers, and damage. Interesting. Other than that, you just need a pencil, character sheet, um, core book, and most importantly, imagination. It is designed to aid in theater of the mind style of play, although it's possible to convert our, into grids and minis. It's I get the feeling that it's not um. Playing playing this on playing this on a grid setup would not be to its strengths. Yeah. Um. So let's see. It features the region known as Gorsham in a high fantasy setting. This is include this includes settings to get your feet wet in the system, including the core rules. Our future plan is to eventually bring the other realms as supplements with each realm, design designed to bring something new to the multiverse. Or you can create your own legacy using your own homebrewed worlds combined with the core rules. And then they have a prototype character sheet, which um, looks like one of the character sheets I would try and whip together in Word. No, no disrespect, guys. <laughs> it's their first outing on that. Mm -hmm. They can be forgiven. Plus, it's functional. So. Yep. Um. I look at how I look at how they're doing their attribute setup and um. As well as as well as the whole skill skill ranks, and I end up thinking more along the lines of um, Warhammer Fantasy roleplay rather more than anything else. I mean, I know that doesn't corner the market on roll on, on roll under D one hundred systems, um, but I can I couldn't compare this to say um, RuneQuest. This is a yeah. little bit too simple by RuneQuest comparisons. Let's see, it is doing a skill-based system with a degree of a degree of outcomes. Um, 
So a one to five is is a is an exceptional success. No surprise there. Um, a success is when you roll under. A partial success is when you roll the exact same number as the as the skill. And a hard fit and or also also known as a soft fail. And a hard fail is when you roll a ninety six or higher. But nice. you get favor when this when this happens. I'm guessing favor is their extra effort system. And for me, the big for me the big thing when it comes to doing this is I'd need to see what the what the um, average starting out um, values are for characters. Because if you look at say Warhammer, mm -hmm. um, like the ever the average starting value for attributes on the well, the is forty percent at the highest, yeah. and I'm of the I'm of the opinion that that um the uh, that the ideal when there's no when there's no pot when there's no possible um mod when there's no possible modifiers before modifiers are even put in that the median should be you have a fifty fifty chance of doing something. Yeah. Now, of course, that's before you put in skills, difficulties, and all the and all the other moving parts. But as they say, the devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. And if I ever, if I ever get Scott Hibbert on the show, I'm probably going to ask him about that. But yeah, we do. They do have seven traits. Um, each is given a rank similar to skills, but modified passively. Interesting. Let's see, they do have exploits. So this so we're not gonna be dealing with the mages are the only cool people trap. Uh mages. Mm -hmm. but as far as now the legacy system which they want to use to bring characters from other universes into into later ones. I'm thinking of something like the whole Epic Destinies in 4th edition, but that's probably not accurate. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, as I said, 4th edition was never really my cup of tea, so I'm, I never really explored it very yeah. uh, much in depth. 4th um, edition had, to, had, um, had a kind of three-tier path. Um, first, first, is, first is here is... Here is um, is the heroic tier, which was um, the first ten levels, and you're mainly getting stuff from your class. Then there was the paragon tier, which was the um, teens levels, um, and that was where you would um, get access to paragon paths, basic, uh, basically your advanced stuff. And then the um, higher tier for um, the twenties and uh, the twenties all the way to, up to level thirty was your epic destiny. And within the Epic Destiny, there would always be a blurb about 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 a way to possibly retire that character. Mm -hmm. um, which is honestly something that I liked, especially since um, Epic level play has always been something that's been iffy. Yeah. <laughs> Even going all the way back to the Immortals book back in first edition, it's not it, they um nobody ever really got a handle on it. Yeah. Epic levels. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a... some. I know some people argue. Well, you shouldn't be playing at that high level, anyways. You're over. You're overpowered. I'd argue that. I'd argue that that only applies if you go with the go with the notion that you can only that you're only supposed to be playing low fa low fantasy shit. Like if I want to do some cosmic fan some cosmic fantasy like something off of a metal album cover, I should be able to do it. Yeah, and and that's why, for a for a time, there was that loosely defined bracketing system for how how much power is in your game, the tier one, tier two, or tier three. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that over on uh, Giant in the Playground, they still use that system, and uh, and define certain game types and game styles where you are facing down some. Uh, semi-phenomenal, nearly cosmic powers, to quote Genie, um, <laughs> are are still 
tier two, and then of course facing down Cthulhu is a tier three type game. Yeah. Uh, well, let's be honest. Places like Giant in the Playground are the only places where people are actually doing de- actually doing real development when it comes to the D twenty system. <laughs> that I can't deny, and you know they do it better than Wizards. Not that that's hard. Um, True. I would also bring True. up the. It's I'd a also, low bar. I would also bring up the brilliant gamesologists, but um. The only thing I got out of them was an excessive amount of math and the um, tier system regarding regarding class usefulness. And would it surprise you at all if I say that clerics and druids are tier one classes? <laughs> let's see. Um. Let's see. We got a few things on the on the matter of stretch goals. Um, they're going to be handling artworks in house from Tony Stevens, and he shows a bit of his work. Um, not too not too shabby. Yeah, that's a. Those are some pretty nice pictures. Um. I like some of the stylization on some of these, like the the guy with the eye patch. Mm-hmm. Uh, that stylization is really interesting looking. I like the almost, how it catches. Does, does it almost look um, stained glass ish? Stained glass or um, almost um, Starry Night, so it's slightly Van Gogh. Watercolor. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and it's it's. Uh, a really cool piece that's that like i was scrolling through the artwork i'm like oh yeah that looks like you know that looks cool that looks cool and then i just had to stop on that one i'm like okay now that one looks really cool yeah um (laughs) best of best of luck to you to you guys and um well if i ever bring you on the show i promise i will not make it i will not make any walking in memphis jokes (laughs) Um, and oh this one get oh Byzantium canceled this one. Ah, damn. Oh. And they were so close, too. Yeah, and they were $6 away. Let me let me see the conversion. So, converted that into Australian dollars, they were not they were $9.68 away from their goal. It would have taken one basic tier pledge. Mm-hmm. One. And they would have been at goal. Hey. But let's see, it said so so it seems it seems that they can it seems that they canceled before the uh, deadline. Um it says unfortunately, however, we have been having some issues behind the scenes. We're currently having trouble with the supplier due to COVID nineteen, which needs to be resolved before we're able to release legacies and dynasties. While we're working hard to support that to sort out that situation, at this point we're unable to guarantee any timelines. We've decided that rather than forge ahead and attempt to deliver a product of unknown quality at an unknown date, we are instead going to postpone the Kickstarter for the time being. Continue to work hard at finding a solution, and once we have a 100% guarantee that the product you receive will be of the highest level, we will restart the Kickstarter, hopefully early in the new year. We apologize for any inconvenience, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Also, any current backers that return to us when we kick off again will be will receive a special reward free of charge for your loyalty. All right. That's really cool. Oh, hey, our supplier is, is being, you know, negatively affected by the beer bug. Who knew? <laughs> so instead of telling you guys, oh, we might have it out at this time and it may not be as good as we said it would, we're going to wait until it's exactly as good as we said it would be. And for those of you who supported us, you get freebies on top of it. Mm-hmm. That's just... I love that. That, now, that is good. Yeah, and um, I'm probably going to I'm probably gonna shoot Byzantium Gaming Studios a, um, lo- a line just saying, Look, I know you guys. I know you guys have been postponing, but when you get, but when you um when you get it off when you get it back off the ground, um if you um shoot shoot me a line and we'll and I'll try and see if I can get get you on the temple. I'd love to hear from them. Mm-hmm. That's that's a uh, that's definitely they were so close too. 
Oh, man. <laughs> so next we have Theorycraft, which is describing itself as a character development planner. Um, so Munchkin book. Got it. Yeah. And <laughs> what I found kind of amusing is I found out about this because the because they they for some reason followed me on Twitter. Some reason. Mm -hmm. I don't know, monk. You're getting bigger, so you might you might actually have a lot more people who are up and comers yeah. coming to the monastery, which is flattering. Um, they're asking for 500 pounds. They are currently at 1,200, with yep. 34 it, days to go. They're way over. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. So it's a care. It's a character development planner for D and D. Um, Theorycraft optimize and develop every character concept you ever had, then s store them securely for when adventure calls. Um, they they already met their first stretch mm -hmm. goal at a thousand pounds. Upgraded yeah. specs will upgrade your book covers to hardback with a matte finish look. Yep. They forgot the E on matte, but that's okay. Most people don't remember that E when they're saying that word. Let's see. Um, the, th the theory, the theory craft character development planner contains 20 character stat journals enough to theory craft and track your greatest character concepts from first to 20th level record all the pertinent information required, um, quick, quickly populate. I think there's a bit of a typo there. Quickly populate your chosen character sheet to the correct character level for your adventure. Track classes, stats, skills, feats, flaws, spellcasting abilities, and your character's development background, all easily displayed for your use and development of your greatest hero. Like I said, Munchkin Planner. Mm -hmm. um, all, of, all the min-maxers are going to use this thing. They had previously done a 3.5 version of this. Now they're doing a 5e version of it. Um, they said future revisions will be planned for 4th edition and both editions of Pathfinder. I wonder if Pun Pun was planned in one of these. I... Doubt it. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> Godzilla was probably planned in one of these, though. Yeah, but Pun Pun, literally the most broken thing ever. The, the weirdest thought experiment I'd ever seen come up on TG. Yeah, now... It's... So what... So let's see... Let's see what they were, what they're at currently. They're at, um, they're at twelve ninety one. So I can check. So they've unlocked upgraded specs. So they'll be doing hardbacks. Nice. Yep. Um. The main, the main question that I have about this kind of thing, and I, and um, it's something I'd have to consider if I bring them, if I um bring them on is is this going to be skewed towards vanilla cla vanilla races and class setups or is there going to be enough flexibility for for um if i'm covering some if i'm covering some third party material that's a little bit non-standard like say if i'm integrating the spheres of power into this oh god Likely, it's it's probably going to be extremely um, vanilla for what's already in there, but it it looks like they're also one of their stretch goals is to add more pages for more stuff. Uh, I mean, the next tier is uh, more new pages to cover familiars, paladins, mounts, animal companions, magic items. Um, I mean, while all from, while all are vanilla, that's still more content and more pages, and it looks like at the at the uh, the highest tiers, they're gonna do things like add a campaign journal, you know, cover your epic campaign details and your adventures. You could probably use that that journal mm -hmm. to record homebrew stuff or if you get them on uh you can say as a small amount of feedback you might want to consider you know some of these logs just having a 
a blank page for homebrew ideas or even just third party ideas. But it, it definitely looks from some of the example pictures that it's pretty straightforward vanilla stuff. All right. So next is the Wagadu Chronicles, a Afro fantasy MMO for roleplay, and apparently, and the sole reason I'm covering it is that it is that they also want to do a five E compatible tabletop setting. Um, just a bit of advice here, um, to, um Twin Drums, don't become Pathfinder Online. <laughs> Because, uh. dear lord, that was a death. That was a death of a game that never, that didn't even get a chance to happen. So, they were asking for a hundred thousand euro. They are currently at a hundred seven thousand six hundred seventy six point five euro. With thirty three days to go. And they've hit their first uh, stretch goal. Mm -hmm. A uh, navigation navig system, which. Given that you're doing an MMO, would be apropos. Apparently, they have a fifth edition lore book, which yes, I did grab. Um, they want to do an Afro fantasy setting for online and offline role play, which interesting. Um, doing, claiming to be the first MMO community built entirely around role play. I don't know about that. There, there is a very old community of, of players playing a game all collectively online uh, that is cent centered around roleplay. It's so old, it doesn't have graphics. Multi-user dungeons, MUDs, uh, a lot of people focused on roleplay on those. So yeah. I, I would say that that, that claim is... A little misleading. I, I would say, I would say, I would say, making this kind of claim is like is like saying um, Gary Coleman is a taller version of Webster. And yes, I know I've used that joke before, but it still applies. Ah, <laughs> uh, that joke always gets me. Um, but ta tailored for everything. For rolls, rolls to mechanics, continuous releases of lore material, in character roleplay as a default, off-world lobbies, and granted, the social aspect of MMOs ha is something that um, I think di desperately needs a kick in the ass. But at the same at the same time, um, people are only people are not going to be as in are only going to be invested up to a point when it comes to lore. I can see your point. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as as far as the five e book, I'd say that I'd say that ha that's going to have a longer shelf life, especially since Kickstarter driven MMOs don't exactly have the best track record. Yeah, that's unfortunately true. I mean, I hate, I hate to, I hate to keep, I hate to keep slagging on them. And if, I, if by some miracle I can actually bring, um, um, twin drums on, I'd probably focus on the on the five E material because that. Yeah. Um. Because because that would be what I'm what I'd be more int I'd be more interested in now. Appar apparently, th the approach that they took was what if Tolkien were black, which um, <sighs> you know, if you just said that you wanted that you want to do an a an African fantasy setting, I'd be perfectly fine with that. But seriously, don't bring Tolkien into this. That just makes me. Annoyed. Yeah. Um, but apparently they did a lot of research 
um, on the mythologies and traditions of people across the African continent, which, um, that makes me raise an eyebrow because I don't know if, I don't know how long it's been since your geography class, but, um, Africa is fucking huge. You know, at the very, at the very least, when the game, ba when the RPG Bastion was made, it was only focused on West Africa, which is at least a more reasonable net to cast. Africa, I believe, is the second biggest continental plate. Yeah. Not counting. Not, uh, no, yeah, yeah. Africa, and then I think Antarctica after that. Mm -hmm. Um. But the the thing the the thing is when whenever I see whenever I see this kind of thing is that. Let's be honest. When a lot of people are when a lot of people are going with the whole Africa thing, they're usually focused on 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 either Sahara or the Niger Delta. Yeah, and this looks to be focused on both. Um, that's that said, it's funny that they it's funny that they talk about the um, lineages being similar to races but more nuanced, and yet. The way that they describe it, the way that they're describing the these lineages, um, all I can, all I can think of is the is the job tribes in Black Panther. <laughs> <laughs> Each tribe does a job. It's almost a caste system at that point. I mean, yeah, we've we've um. Now they say that each is inspired by different regions, but I'm not see I'm not um, I'm not seeing it. You know, I would laugh if it, if this weren't. <sighs> no, I'm I'm still gonna laugh. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Emer, the ancient forest people, masters of juju magic. I'm sorry, I can't not laugh at that. I know it's a serious thing, but... <sighs> I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am too drunk for this. And you haven't even had anything yet to drink yet. Yes! <laughs> <sighs> but... And yeah, they they apparently are doing a special cinematic called dialogue mode. The problem is trying to do a story trying to do a story focused MMO in this regard um, is is rife with problems, especially due especially due to the fact that you've got a that in order in order for this to even work, you need to have a lot of people engaged in the story. And the problem is that's not how people engage in MMOs. Now them wanting to do a no classes no grind skill based system. Um, okay. Okay. Although you can you kind of undercut that by using art that's specifically designed to evoke D and D classes. So we yep. have barbarian, bard, cleric, paladin, druid, fighter, monk, hunter, rogue. Um, and they all they all look like they're from different tribes too. There's different uh, clothing styles, different uh, builds. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the um, I guess the vibe I can I can say of this is that when it when it comes to the MMO part of this um, endeavor. I'm very skeptical. When it comes to the when it comes when it comes to the um when it comes to the yeah. um idea of it being a D and D module, a little less so. But the but the problem that the problem that I'm still having is it's still going to be conform it's still going to be conforming to the to the um class motifs that D and D has. Yeah, and. Uh... And because of that, there's going to be the uh, the eternally offended who see that as a 
simplifying rich culture and yada 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 mm -hmm. um as much as twin drums may try to appeal to them because oh but you know we're doing this because we really want an afrocentric uh mmo and tabletop rpg uh, they're gonna be like well you've 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 just made it look like it's like it's a joke a stereotype a caricature that's gonna be that's gonna suck i hope they can roll with that um Like what? For me, for me, it's going to be a case of I am. I might take a look at the full book when that comes around, but that's as far as I'm willing to go. Ooh, ooh! I think their MMO is going to do a lot worse than you might think. Why do you say that? Under a role-playing sandbox, there's a line uh, under some of the the points about the game. Additionally, every item can be lost or stolen when you get slain. Be careful. Do you want griefers? Because that's how you get griefers. You're going to have people who sit outside newbie towns and kill newbies and take all their new stuff. Yeah, that's fucking griefing. Yep, that's, that's going to be exactly the same as what happened in um, Elite Dangerous. That's why that's why everybody and that's why everybody in Tor hates hates using open world PvP because of people who will just um will just sit will just sit right will just sit on a on a um on some on a quest giver hoping that you click on them accidentally. Yep. This is why you should always use tab uh, tab selection in MMOs, children. Because at least then you can see what you're selecting. I do, and I I got I got busted twice, but even even that even then I just hate I just hate that whole I just hate having to go through that amount of lengths on principle. Yeah, it's it's unnecessary, and those people are just you know stupid assholes. Mm -hmm. Especially since whenever I bring up the kind of thing, people always say, "Well, you just need to pay more attention." Yeah, because of course it's my f it's my fault that somebody decided to abuse decided to abuse a loophole. The people who say we should just bring attention are the people who aren't affected. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so next we have a we have a uh, comic coming to us from Chad Harden. Jeez, that's an unfortunate name. <laughs> Ryan Brown and Mark and Mark May. Are you sure it's unfortunate, or maybe it's super fortunate? Is it Chad? And well, anyways, <laughs> what we have here is Hellbringers, the Sacred Heart. They're asking for five thousand. They they are at five point six thousand with thirteen days to go. And apparently, he's been working on comics in one form or another since two thousand six covers look nice too so let's see lucifer has vanished without warning leaving the pact of the realm of death and unrest and on the brink of war now his bride lilith must try to reclaim the realm in his absence but not everyone wants to bow to her rule with enemies at every turn lilith searches for the sacred heart to increase her power to gain the allies she needs to claim her missing husband's throne I mean, that sounds like an interesting, uh, if somewhat rote, uh, concept. Mm -hmm. we, we've, we've probably seen stories like this before. I'd want to see the difference in execution. Yeah. Um, let's see, they're doing, so they're going to be doing 16 pages in full, in full color. Let me see how much they're asking for that. Um... Only five dollars for the digital and ten dollars for issue one. That'd be standard for an it for a um for an issue, so it's not too much. Um twenty for a single trade variant. And then thirty for a single virgin variant. 
and then 40 for a Chad Harden variant. Let's see, I do, I do like the variant that Mark May has. That's a really cool variant mm -hmm. cover. Um, I could, I could see, I could see this, I could see this um, working out fine for people who are fans of, say, Vampirella or um, Lady Death. In fact, Lady Death is these is what I'm being reminded of the most here. Chrome cover. Oh. Wow. Not sure if I'd go that far. And <laughs> holy shit, the ultimate col collector. Nope. Um, I am not. I am not paying one. I am not paying. I am not that much of a whale. But the the um the thousand dollars for everything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll try. Maybe I'll try and shoot him an email and see and see and see if he'd be open to coming on the show. It'd be nice. Mm -hmm. It'd be pretty cool to get it out there. Yeah. Um. So next we have Esper's Emporium of Esoterica. Now this one amuses me because Esper the Bard is somebody who I've known about on YouTube for a long time. He's um. making a third-party supplement book for 5e? Yeah. Let's see. Monsters, new classes, subclasses, spells... Magic items, cursed items, and more. So it's a funnier version of Xanathar. Mm-hmm. Let's see. The new character class is the Paragon. Renegade for life. Um, <laughs> it's designed to be a non-spellcaster with the depth of a spellcaster. Every level has a serendipitous... Encounter with a wise guide and uses special abilities called wonders to produce all sorts of extraordinary maneuvers and effects that are based on skills. There are three myths featured. The myth of the hero, which is a heroic warrior of legend. The myth of the scion, a leader type character with a companion. And the myth of the trickster. Yeah, some, somebody, had been, somebody had been spending time in their mythology class. Um... For subclasses, we have the Reaver Barbarian, which is Conan as fuck, the Gladiator Fighter, um, self-explanatory, the Majesty Domain Cleric, a which reflects the ascension to godhood, the Way of the Blessed Modus, Lotus Monk, um, a who someone who follows the ideal of the White Lotus. Uncle Iroh? Um, <laughs> actually, in, actually, in this case, I don't think it's Uncle Iroh, I think it's Pi Mei. <laughs> just rem just remember if he get if he gives you a slight nod acknowledge it don't don't ignore don't ignore it other otherwise um that's that'll be the last thing you ignore and everybody you know yep because let's not forget somebody not acknowledging the fact that he gave him that he gave a slight nod was enough to get the Five point palm treatment. Five point palm exploding heart technique. Uh. Let's see. Magic items, cursed items, and magic shops. Traps and hazards. DM advice. Um, he's shooting for 250 pages, but the stretch goals might increase this by up to 100. Considering uh, it would add. Two more new races, double the spells, magic items, and traps, add feats, double the shops, and double the feats, mm -hmm. depending on how high he gets. Oh, and new, more monsters. Yep. I mean, you, you would just get a, a ton more, depending on how much he gets. I would laugh my ass off if this, end, if this ends up getting the 50k and ends up being a better version of Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Well, he's already at double spells. At this point, mm -hmm. For, just to hit fourteen thousand and ten, so we're already going to see that expansion. And as, and I find that in stretch goals where they promise more material, like substance to whatever's being promised, 
things that would materially add to the experience, um, they tend to generate hype and snowball. So if somebody sees that, it, oh, now he's at a double amount of spells, maybe we can go double amount of magic items, and it'll just continue going from there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I see. I see this one going far. And I may shoot him. I may shoot him a line so I can have some sort of full circle thing going on. <laughs> be like, yo, <laughs> yo. It'd um, be funny to have him on. Yeah. So our penultimate one is Grim Ho- is Grim Hollow the player's guide, which is meant to be a companion for character creation in dark fantasy settings. They were asking for thirty thousand, and holy shit! They're nearly at six times their goal. Yeah, and they have got 27 days. Uh, uh what was their stretch goal? Oh, uh, their find... stretch goals. We'll find out in the we'll find out in a moment. Um, although apparently one of the arcane traditions they have is Zang- is Sangromancer, i.e., blood magic. Um, tasty. Can play as an elemental or as a fey. Blood magic along with new spells. A horde of new magic items. Jeez, they had a bunch of stretch goals that they hit. I like this mint. I like this mini. He looks like he'd be on the cover of a Hammerfall album. <laughs> yeah. Also, if you ha- also for those listening, go listen to a Hammerfall album. You'll thank me later. Monk ain't lying. When he's ever, when has he ever led his uh, flock astray before? Um, and given given some of the dark fantasy games that I've talked about um, on the monastery, this might be a natural fit for some of them. And when it comes to the minis, um, okay. Well, when it comes to the ranger, I think I can I think I can know what their favorite um, Robert E. Howard character is. Which incidentally, is, one incidentally, cosplaying as Solomon Kane has always been on my bucket list. I can see it. And maybe, maybe sometime during Halloween season, I might um, I might make a movie night out of the um, Solomon Kane movie. It's it's not great, except for James Purefoy, who absolutely nails the character. But um, it's a good shl- it's a good bit of schlockiness. Isn't that the best? Yeah, like, look, I, I realized that after the Lord of the Rings movies, there was this there was this turn towards making um fan, making fantasy movies and TV shows that were more serious. But sometimes I just want something something completely stupid. Sometimes that's all you want. And that's why um, a lot of people really hated that that um Conan movie from two thousand eleven. I loved it. Because Momoa did a fantastic job. Yeah, there was the problem of trying of trying to um, do too many things at once, but the but the um, but the big problem was people assumed it was a remake of of the nineteen eighty two classic. It's not. And of course, the 1982 classic, as we've discussed before, is nothing like the books. Mm-hmm. This one, I'd this one isn't. I'd say it's a little bit closer, but not quite. A little bit closer, being that it's a little more serious. That's really it. Because the Conan books could get really serious and really dark. Oh yeah. Um. I'd actually, I'd actually, I would actually say that a lot of people who claim that they grew up with Conan probably didn't grow up with the books. They grew up with the um, Marvel version. They, they grew up with Arnie. I'd say, I'd say Arnie as well as the, um, as well as the Marvel comics that um, John Buscema did, which are really good. I should note. They are. But let's see. When it comes to the, when it comes to the other ones. Um, why do we have to go with a blind monk again? I don't know, but it still looks badass. Mm-hmm. Um, although the the although the one when it comes to the spellcaster classes, the one that I think 
I like the most is the Warlock. Yeah, probably because of the two Ravens. Yeah. <laughs> I knew exactly I knew, why. I wonder who his house. patron is. I can't imagine. Perhaps the Raven Keeper. Mm hmm Let's see. Let me have a few other motifs. I gotta say, though, those transformations, that mm -hmm. Seraph looks freaking amazing. I'd say, both, I'd say both that and the... um, I like the Lich. The Lich is super cool, too. Mm -hmm. Like, if nothing else, that box would be worth. You've got the Fiend and the Lich and the Seraph that all look just yeah. awesome. I, um, I may shoot... I may shoot them a message, and I may end up regretting it because they're all the way out in Melbourne, which makes me wonder why this isn't converted into Australian dollars. Probably because they realize that their primary uh, money-making will be done in the U.S.? Mm. There's all... There's... Crowdfunds, um, all, crowdfunds always have ways to automatically convert currency. I, I'm, I'm talking more about... Um outside of the crowdfunding itself that their primary audience is probably going to be in the u.s unless this is another case of the brazilian problem which if that was the case i i wouldn't be surprised one bit that too that could be an issue mm -hmm. our last one is return to planet apocalypse it's a very abstract kind of hell and i can make that joke because this is coming to us from sandy peterson <laughs> So, initially, this initially he, a while back, he had made a board game called Planet Apocalypse. This is meant to be an expansion of that, and a five E source book on the matter. Um, I am very tempted to shoot him a line simply because simply because um, I'd simply because I'd um probably I'd probably um ask him a few things as well as as well as well as see if I can see if I can under see if I can ascertain who's responsible for Slough of Despair. <laughs> yeah, let's make a map shaped like a hand. That'd be that'd be a brilliant idea in a game that's that's more favored towards o towards open environments and mobility. It was specifically meant to mess with you, monk. Uh-huh. <laughs> Got some interesting little tidbits. Mm -hmm. And holy shit, the holy shit, those minis. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's let's be real here. Did he did he draw inspiration from Giger? Because it looks like a lot of it draws inspiration from Giger's uh, particular brand of horror and, and esoterica. It wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me given all given all the stuff that he's done. Um. Now, Shut Up and Sit Down has described this game as having cemented Sandy Peterson as the king of games where you roll dice and things die. <laughs> but I'm mainly I'm mainly interested in the um bo in the book. Although god damn it. 666 backers gets an added ribbon to the hardcover book. Really? Really? <laughs> really? The diabolical deal. Mm. You also get a dice pack and a bunch of minis and yeah. Um, board game veteran one hell sixty nine. <sighs> <laughs> trying i'm trying i'm trying <laughs> just roll with it just roll with it monk it's all intentional and you know it oh i know and that's why i that's why i'm angry oh be happy the fact that he's nine times above goal that i'm perfectly fine with um Oh hey, it's our old friend the Caco. 
He's um he's at a facelift. <laughs> I don't know if you can call that a facelift. Face flip. That a little more. <laughs> That's a little more accurate, I think. Honestly, when honestly when I look at a lot of I look at a lot of this, I see a little bit of Giger and a little bit of Wayne Barlow. And the diabolical deal all in six hundred and sixties. Oh, you should have known he would have do done that. Come on. That was an obvious uh, pledge amount for yeah. something dealing with hell. Uh, well, the, at the very at the very least, when the church people come in, I can I I might I might grab the hard copy version of the uh, the RPG book just so I can horrify them and get them to, and I, and get them the hell out of my house. You know, some to some to bring in, something to bring into cat to be casually reading when the um, um, Jehovah Witnesses come knocking. That sounds uh, sounds like what I uh, what I would do with um, with the the uh, witnesses that would come up to our house when I was a kid. Well, at my old at my old place, they stopped coming around because I kept finding new and interesting ways to annoy them. Least the witch is blowing a whistle just as they're about to give their speech. And then as soon as they start it up again, blow the whistle. Honestly, if you it, it's 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 I'm not going to lie, in most cases if you just tell them, "Yeah, we're not interested. Don't come back or we'll call the cops." They uh they, they'll leave you alone. Mm -hmm. Um so apparently apparently one of apparently one of the items that they're putting in stretch goals for free is Commander K. Blaskowitz. Gee, I wonder what this is based on. Um, I'm gonna say it's based on. Um, yeah, I got nothing. I can't come up with a good witty one-liner. It's Commander is... Keen combined with Doom. No, not not Commander Keen. Um, Wolfenstein. Well, but the, but the thing is, Commander Keen, Commander K. Blaskowitz. Oh, yeah. The, uh, Commander, I can add. Commander Keen, Wolfenstein, and Doom are all connected. They're all descendants. Like, ultimately, Doom Slayer is a descendant of of Wolfenstein's Blaskowitz, and Keen fits into that that um that lineage somewhere. Mm -hmm. this, oh. this was actually semi, sort of, kind of, but not really confirmed by ID. And let's see, let's see. then we got the timeline, and, in fact, and then he goes did. into his track record, and yeah, he's he's had he's had a lot, as as well as going in some of the stuff that he's designed. Um, along with plant, and it probably would not surprise you if I say that a good chunk of the stuff that he's designed is in is in my catalog in one form or another. Um, I think the only thing in here that that I the only thing on his list that I don't have is hyperspeed. Okay. The ultimate goal: if they get one million dollars on Kickstarter, the secrets of Hellbox will include a new fourth circle demon, the Hell Penguin. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, hell, penguin. <laughs> yeah. They got nine days to go. Well, then. Unfortunately, the, the hell penguin remains unsummoned. Oh, please. You know it's, you know it's going to end up being a stretch goal. Not a stretch goal. You know it's going to end up being in a um, in a D in a, a DLC or some sort of convention exclusive thing. You know how this works. Like I said, it remains unsummoned. That doesn't mean it can't be summoned later. <sighs> yeah, I walked into that. So next we have Steamforged Games working on something, and for for what it's worth, Steamforged Games are the same people who do the Dark Souls board game. 
Yep. And they are currently working on something called Bardsung, a procedurally generated dungeon crawler. Let's see. It can be played in about 45 to 60 minutes and needs one to five players. So you, you can solo that dungeon. Mm-hmm. Terrain and encounters are procedurally generated. Uh, okay, you've got an interesting idea. Let me see what the board looks like. I like this part of the idea. So you want to play a thief with a little bit of cleric mixed in? You can. Want to play a fighter with access to powerful magic spells? You can. Want to dig into the hundreds of combinations of abilities to discover amazingly powerful combos to pull off at the table? You can. It's I... a... It's a Munchkin's wet dream. I get the feeling this is gonna this is gonna be a little similar to Gloomhaven, if anything. That's just the vibe that I'm getting. I can see it. So next, um, Blackstorm Realms is the is gonna be the latest project that'll be um, that'll be launched in a couple days, and Jim Pinto is on is on board with this project. So maybe I can use this to get him back on. All I gotta say, just looking at the very beginning of this article, I really like that giant whale thing with the <laughs> with the uh, that is essentially a flying machine. Yeah, um, I hope that doesn't end up being the Hindenburg of this setting. So well, they're... considering it's made out of a living being, I think it's probably going to be worse than the Hindenburg. Probably, at least <laughs> I'm not riding it. Um. You wouldn't be able to get me to step on that thing. I, I would tell you to, to fuck right the hell off. I'll walk. Yep. So, let's see. The Space Fantasy game offers ways to link settings together as different worlds. For the launch, Jetpack 7 will provide three unique new worlds for busy GMs. Um, they apparently are doing a character customization feature called Apartum, which can enhance bodies and minds, but may also cause insanity. As you do. So it's the essence system. Got it. Mm -hmm. New classes, race, races, spells, and magic items come with the new setting, along with galaxy-spanning villains set on the course to dominate all worlds they find or destroy those who resist. I'm looking at this kind of thing, and um, am I the only one who's thinking that this is the that that this is the um, the third-party end of things, find, giving us a spell jammer that um, the core people aren't that the core people aren't giving us. Might be. Seems like it. Mm -hmm. So next. JT, I'm sorry, but the Batman rule ended up happening. Oh, no. Monolith is making a Batman RPG. Called Gotham City Chronicles. This is a bit of a jump for two reasons. One, doing it for Batman of all things. Um, so why, one not player just, why not just make a Gotham City RPG? If you're, if you're doing it for Batman specifically, you've now got a one-player game. Yeah. You're better off doing a game book in that regard. Two, um, this is going to be Monolith's first full-on RPG. Up until this point, they have done board games and done them very well. Their Conan board game is really, really fucking good. And the um, Batman miniatures game is decent as well. So apparently they're doing five fantastic books. <sighs> so Gotham's Heroes by Francois Versate, a fully adapted D20 system rulebook. Um, the Gotham City Guide, who, which is going to be handled by Xavier Formier and Alex Nikovalich. Helped by Francois Hercolette, who is the editor for the French publisher of DC Comics. Um, Gotham's Chronicles by Nicolas Texier, Olivier Chiara, and Maihar Siakeri. I am apologizing in advance for mispronouncing all of your names. I should have at least left the French mm -hmm. names to me. I took some high school French. Um, <laughs> in order... In order to provide the broadest roleplay experience possible, the remaining two books will be campaign settings revealed during a during the Kickstarter campaign. 
it's certainly it's certainly ambitious. Um, the one the one thing that I, the one thing that I will note is when it come when it comes to DC has not ha- neither of the big two have had any hand in um, role in role playing games in any form in almost a decade. In fact, let me let me um do let me do a bit of checking to see when was when the last time one of them the had last a... so for the last um, DC one was D, was DC was DC Adventures that was in 2013 and yeah it was basically a backdoor um for for the third edition of mutants and masterminds that's interesting marvel heroic role playing was 2012 Also, I couldn't I couldn't help but notice that when I did a Google search for for Marvel Heroic Role Playing, the first video that comes up calls it the most complicated RPG ever. Bitch, please. I don't know how anyone can say that when something like I this ran happens. Cortex for years. Or Cortex. Don't remind me about Cortex. I re- well, Cortex Plus in this case. I ran I ran that for a long ass time and calling that complicated is laughable. Okay, maybe maybe if you're somebody who lives and dies by the D20 system, everything is complicated by that by that metric. And yet also simpler. But you want to talk comp any look. Anybody who brings up that or at or any or any other, any other game that Critical Role is playing and calls it complicated, I will find you and I will beat you half to death with the Hero System Handbook. <laughs> and then I will switch that out for the GURPS books and I will beat you to the other half. Oh, come on. You're not going to pull out the, the cacophony that is the Rifts books and just beat them with all of them? Do you realize how heavy all those books would be? Yeah, you just have to drop it on them, and then they're dead. <laughs> I mean, that's like a literal half ton of books. Anyway, so you know how last week we talked about that um, countdown for um, Hero Quest? Well, and now it's all up and running. Yeah, and it looks it looks like um, looks like this is going to be the flagship for this new for this new incarnation of Avalon Hill. Um, I am going to, I'm going to say, now they decided to use Hasbro Pulse to do, um, crowdfund for it, which caused a few people to get salty. I have seen, um, a few people get bitchy about the, about the new art that it looks too World of Warcrafty. I, um, I find, I find that to be forced for the trees kind of thing. I mean... I was gonna say, how is that relevant? Um, there, there did, ha- there were a few complications in the matter, simply because of the fact that, keep in mind, the original Hero Hero Quest had Games Workshop's hands in it. Yeah. So they, so they had to get their cut out of things, and um, the name Hero Quest, of course, for the longest time was um, was under the control of um, Chaosium. Mm-hmm. You know, because because it was an because there was a hero quest that was an offshoot of um, Rune Quest, but it looks but it looks like it's coming back. I guarantee some people are going to say that the classic version is somehow superior because reasons. But I'm def- I'm definitely going to be keeping a close eye on how, on how this goes out. I will say this. And let me say this slowly so that everybody can hear this. I will not buy Hero Quest through Hasbro Pulse. I'm going to wait until an official release and get it from an LGS or get it from or get it from 
a uh, forget it from one of my online sellers. Hasbro's web store is absolute fucking trash. And it has been fucking trash for years, no matter how many times they try and rebrand it. They don't know how to do web coding. Well, the last time that the last time I ordered from them, um, they en they ended up deliver they ended up delivering to the wrong house, and I and I had to go through this lengthy fight to get my money back. Was the house in another city or something? Yes. How, how postal codes, but how? Look, you should you should know that you can never make something idiot proof. I'm not. I'm not saying it is idiot proof. I'm just saying that this would have had to have been deliberate idiot tampering. You can set up a program to automatically generate a postal a a, 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 a an address an address sticker based off of the postal information you input. There should have been nothing that interfered with that process. Mm -hmm. Someone had to have gone in and changed the postal code and city. All I know is I didn't get what I asked for. Yeah. No, I... Trust me, I've been through the fights to get money back. Yep. I understand. But meanwhile, we have another case of... Hey, have we kicked, have we kicked the uh, stadia in the balls any time this month? Let's do that again. <laughs> Because if X if X Cloud was a uh, death knell, then I'm pretty sure Amazon Luna will be putting it even further in the ground. They're all cloud gaming systems. They're all shit. They should all just die. Well, here here's the, here's the reason. So apparently, apparently, they're the reason why I'm the reason why I'm saying the reason why I think that um the Luna at least has a as maybe a little bit of hope is the is the fact that there's are there's already some there's already some degree of twi of um twitch integration um but let's let's take a look let's take a look at what at what it's offering so early access. Da, da, da. I find the idea of cloud gaming to be the most anti-consumer thing possible. Um, if if I will put this, they will have they will have a better chance of surviving if they if they have the attitude of you of um. You you go you go with the pricing and you get and you get the library. Um, that sa that said, Amazon Luna will probably not be gracing my temple because I need because I need to know how how much they're charging for the for the um, yeah. basic setup first. Yeah. So, best case scenario, it buries the stadia again. Worst case scenario, it's uh, it ends it ends up um it ends up be it ends up being age it ends up being another joke that we can laugh at. Stadia 2.0 as it were. Yeah. Well, I mean, I laugh at both Google Home and Amazon Alexa, so probably going to mm -hmm. be the second the latter of those two situations. Uh, the, an interesting, th an interesting thing that we ended up getting most recently, and you can bar purchase on the Nine Inch Nail store, is a vinyl copy of the Quake soundtrack. I saw that. I was like, hmm, hmm, but why? For thirty-five bucks. It's cheaper vinyl. Yep, it's a one hundred and eighty gram double LP. And it has all of the names of songs you would expect, especially some we can't say, or, I mean, we could, but. <sighs> um, I'm not, like, 
Well, obviously, I wouldn't end up getting it because I don't, I don't currently have a record player. But um, for those who do, and there is there, there is a decent enough argument to be made when it comes to the, when it comes to the sound out of a record player versus the sound out of CDs. Mm-hmm. Um. But at the same time, it's at the same time, um. You know, just despite my love for Doom, I that love never really transferred over to Quake. You see, I never I never conflated the two. Doom was Doom, Quake was Quake, and I have a different love for each. Yeah. Um I like the first one, but the ones after that I Honestly when honestly when it came to when it came to three D death deathmatch shooters, um Maybe I'm maybe in the minority with, with this, but Unreal had more of a foothold in my house than Quake did. Unreal definitely had a foothold. Um, Unreal was the first arena shooter that that was multiplayer that I ever played. Mm-hmm. Um, and well, I also found it highly amusing that one of the uh, one of the characters had part of my handle in their name. The final boss of, of Unreal Tournament's name is Zan. <laughs> uh, and now we have what I like to call a tale of two studios. Oh, God. So first we have the fact that Mike Morhaime is is um la- is launching a um stu- is launching a new publishing studio called Dreamhaven. Yep. And apparently, alongside it, are going to be two internal game studios, Moonshot Games and Secret Door. And he's got a lot of he's got a lot of ex Blizzard people involved in it, which um, proves that when the when when the whole Hong Kong thing happened with with um, Blizzard fucking up fucking that up and Reforged, I had predicted that you're going to see a lot of. From the developers of Insert Blizzard game here in se- in several projects. Yep. And I mean, Mark, Mark Kern was already uh, taking advantage of that, and um, the rest of uh, the rest of the Blizzard developers could see that it's a successful tactic. Plus, um, I think I think when Morhaime left, that w- that was seen as a that was seen as one of the biggest blows because he. Morhaim to me seemed to be the last of the old guard of Blizzard. Definitely. Blizzard Blizzard hasn't had a lot of their bigger movers and shakers for ages. And with it, with with him go, with him gone and up to, and doing and doing a, a whole new thing. Um I definitely have hopes that I um Although I do, th- I do think Young Ye might have been might have been pushing it a little bit by calling it the anti Activision. <laughs> um, and while the and while they certainly have exper- a experienced team, what I have to say is okay, good job. Now let's see what you're actually going to work on. Can't just ride on name recognition alone. Let's see the work. Yeah, we. Um, I mean, if we wrote on name recognition, then a pre- then then maybe Star Citizen would actually be finished. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, that's a good joke. But speaking of jokes, let's talk about Future Club, which apparently is formed from all the um, Lab Zero staff that left. Were that or were or were uh, or quit in protest or were fired because of because of that whole that whole thing that whole thing that happened where it was revealed that Mike Z is kind is kind of a dick. And appar- now apparently the it stated that one of the key differences between Future Club and Lab Zero is that while the latter was wholly owned by Mike Zymont, aka Mike Z. The former is employee owned and driven totally by the input of all of their employees. 
This has the potential to go really bad, really fast. Why do I hear the Soviet National Anthem in the background? Yeah. Because here, here's, the, here's the problem. The, the, the idea of giving everyone a say in, in the future of an organization, that's nice and all. It's, ve it's very cute. But the problem is, somebody needs to steer the ship. And if you've got if the problem that I the problem that I can see potentially with this kind of thing, and I pointed this out in um in a comment that I left when um full screen boss fight did a video on the matter, is this this you have the potential of everybody not agreeing who's going to be the guy getting coffee. I think. I think they're almost trying to pull a valve without having hierarchy, which means no Gabe Newell. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the CEO here, friend, uh, Francesca Esquenaz, uh, Esquenazi, mm -hmm. I wanted to say that with a soft Z for <laughs> obvious, obvious reasons. Uh, but um, I, I think that while she's said to be CEO, I don't think she's going to be the same type of CEO that you know Gabe Newell was for Valve when Valve was complete because they're still completely employee owned they aren't as far as I know they're not publicly traded even now they, all, mm -hmm. all the shares are owned within the company yeah um, but back when he was you know pulling people from things like uh, graffiti their own internal graffiti projects to get the 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 um, different physics gels for portal two and all of that. Um, he, while they were all people who were, had ownership in the company, Newell was still there to say, okay, so we have a hierarchy. And this sounds like the same idea with no hierarchy, which is a terrible idea. Yeah. And um, now some, now some people have tried to defend this to me. Saying that the thing that beca that with because of the fact that they don't have a hierarchy that th that they'll be able to that um everybody will be able to get a a um equal sh an equal share in terms of input on how on how things work except here's the thing um people who people who develop game people who develop games are hyper focused on that one specific role and you're asking them to make decisions for the entire for the entire company in some form. So you've got one of two situations here. Either most of the developers are not going to pay attention and or they're going to pay lip service. And what's going to happen is one person who wants to be the leader anyway is going to take advantage of that and you're going to have them leading the the uh, company in a very specific fashion that eventually the other devs may be like, well, this this isn't really how I thought we would be running things. Bar or, barring that, you could also what the question that I have to ask is, what are you going to do about the troublemakers? Well, I was going to say, yeah, the the troublemakers are a good point, but the the other broad situation is that all of these people are divas and all of them want it run in a, a specific way mm -hmm. and now they're all going to he butt heads with each other. Yeah. Um, I, now, obvi now obviously if they put, if they put out some decent product, then, th then um, I'll be willing to lay off. But until, but until then, I, ha I just have too many question marks with this kind with this kind of thing. For me, I have too many exclamation points with red triangles around them. Warning, warning, danger, Will Robinson moment. Yeah, pretty much. Now, on to something lighter. Jam Project is getting their own documentary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is fantastic because Jam Project has been around since my childhood and even longer than that. And uh, I would not be the person I am without their music. I'm mm -hmm. not kidding there. I would literally not be the person I am without their music. Mm -hmm. um, this is a super exciting thing for me. I 
I definitely want to see how many of the retired and and uh, older members they get in to talk as well, because every every member that's come in and left has always left a very intrinsic piece of themselves in how Jam Project feels for that uh, era. It's a lot like um, visual K bands when they have multiple front runners come in, and, and each era feels distinct and has its own. Uh, vibrancy. Um, Jam Project, of course, being the guys who have probably sang on every mecha uh, a- anime you've ever seen in the past uh, two decades. Mm-hmm. And definitely on almost every mecha video game in Japan. <laughs> um, I definitely want to see who, who they bring in to talk to for this. Yep. Now... When it com- when it comes to now, um, there is one there is one particular there is one particular story that I'd like to see when it comes to this documentary, and that is the passing of the torch from Mister DBZ Hironobu Kageyama to Masaki Endo. Yeah, yeah. Is Kage even though? He's most known for his D- for his DBZ themes. Kageyama, um, he did a lot of stuff even before Jam Project. Mm-hmm. And um, when he started winding da- down, it's it was very clear that um, Endo was the person he had picked as his successor. Well, and Endo had been a frontman for years too. Mm-hmm. Um, along with Kageyama, because they're both founding members. Yeah. But um, Ka- but Kageyama was get- was getting up there in years at a, at a certain point. I mean, after all, these guys have been doing this for twenty years, and I think that's the reason. I get the feeling that that um, if it weren't if it weren't for the coof, this thing this movie probably would have gotten released in twenty twenty to celebrate that anniversary. But instead, it's going to be releasing sometime next year. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see we'll see how it we'll see how it goes out. Um please let somebody sub it. I will there's even gonna, take fan subs. There there's somebody who's going to sub it. Mm-hmm. It's going to happen. You know I hope I hope they talk to to Fukuyama a bit as well. Um, he's probably my favorite vocalist in Jam Project. All right. Uh, and like, don't get me wrong, Masaki Endo has all has all the screams in the world. The man is the man is Jam Project's own Nobuyuki Hiyama. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, Fukuyama Yoshiki, he uh, he is he's got he's a, he's more of a, a soulsy type singer. He's got a very um, pruner voice to him. Pretty much, whereas um, whereas Kageya, um, somebody like Endo is um, I'd say I'd say I'd say is the Japanese Michael Kisk. Definitely. Um, but next we have this story that broke the fucking internet. Microsoft <laughs> buys Zenimax Media for $7.5 billion. Hey, Microsoft. Microsoft, my first suggestion. Fire Todd. <laughs> it definitely seems that it definitely seems like Microsoft is trying to not is trying to learn from their mistakes the last um, gen- the last console generation, because when it came to the Xbox One, they they shot themselves in the foot hard, and they never recovered. Well, I th- I think they'll still have the same problem here, because um, you don't need an Xbox to play most of the games. You can. Oh yeah, there's de- there's definitely going there's definitely going to be that problem. Um, I will say. 
and then then I saw a video from Yellow Flash where apparently a few Japanese devs are consi are considering jumping over because they're sick of the um, global standards bullshit. Mm -hmm. Which, if that ends up happening, that's going to be quite a coup. If that ends up happening, Sony Japan will outright uh, uh, put the foot down on Sony America, say we're bringing the gaming to, uh, the 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 uh, gaming entertainment center back over to Japan because you guys flubbed it. Yeah, because I think I think they know if they if they lose the, if they lose Japanese support, that's that's gonna really hurt. This Japanese support that shows that whatever's happening is in America is losing them faith with the Japanese, and that's mm -hmm. not something they can accept being a Japanese company. No, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure it'd be hard. I'm pretty sure it'd make I'm pretty sure losing losing faith in that audience would um make it very hard to get a loan from the Japanese government. <laughs> you bet. Or it's equivalent. I I will admit I am a very poor layman when it when it comes to how um when it comes when it comes to how cor when it comes to how um corporate um structures work in Japanese companies. Cuz I know it's not exactly the same as it is here in the states. Yeah. Zybox is are way different. Um Now when it comes now there ha there was the only thing that makes me a little bit concerned is there was that push with um Zenimax not too long ago that um Narwitz had talked about and a few others have talked about mm -hmm. on one ha one having people who are more politically addled, which was the reason why Death of the Outsider and Dishonored Two were such disappointments, but also ha also the fact that that something that they want to try and switch towards live services, which um, I get the f I get the feeling. If this de if this deal goes all the way through with um, Zenimax, mm -hmm. that might put things in an interesting perspective. Um, I do get the feeling that Deathloop is their attempt to try and do a dip into live service, and I get the feeling it's not going to do as well as they'd like to think it will. Most players don't like life services. Um, it seems sort of anti-consumer and somewhat predatory. Yeah. Now, apparently, apparently, they're apparently Microsoft is claiming that they're not going to get all that involved with um, Bethesda. I doubt that's going to last. Micro if Microsoft. Is does anything they need to at least tell bethesda stop using your outdated engine if nothing else because they're going to expect oh yeah the bethesda name will just carry these games for us but less and less people are buying bethesda games because of how buggy they get would you would you say would you say that the um fallout 76 debacle was the was the proverbial straw on the camel's back I think it actually was a two-parter. Half the straw was Fallout 4, because it had a lot of its own bugs and also had some really annoying uh, facets to it mm -hmm. that were caused by the limitations of the engine. The creation engine limited how much Bethesda could innovate. But I think it's more... With, with Fallout seventy six, it's not just the bugs; it's a it's a it's a perfect storm situation with seventy six. You've got the bugs. You've got the fact that at, at launch, it was an online only predatory like PvP game. You 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 could team up with people with your own clans and stuff, but. Everybody was against everybody else. There was there was no co cooperation on on the larger scales, um, and that led to a lot of griefing, um, a lot of uh, bases being lost or won, uh, th things of that nature. And then uh, finally, once things like single player and private lobbies and all of those were introduced. Uh, half that stuff is put behind an insane monthly subscription paywall. Uh, it, it's just, it, it, it's predatory thing after predatory thing after predatory thing just 
give, 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 give us more money. And then there's the fact that, uh, you know, there's the, all the smaller debacles with the collector's editions and every small little thing. It all added up to a perfect storm. And um, it broke faith. Like, Bethesda's faith was already shaky. They were already on thin ice. And that this just destroyed it. Yeah, pretty pretty much, and um, hope we'll see how we'll see how things go. I'm, I um, I know some people are gonna think that future Bethesda releases are gonna be Xbox exclusive. That's not happening. It. So at the very least, they'll be on PC as well because well, it's Microsoft. Also, um, also PC is the only place where they, where where um where they can get where they can get something out of their stuff. The um. The one thing I the one thing I would say is, you need to do something fast to redeem Wolfenstein because the new Colossus shit, mm. Young Blood, mega shit. Like they yep. they talk about all the they have they have this list of all of all their different franchises, but um, Prey was only one game, The Evil Within was um, a mixed bag. Starfield isn't even fucking out yet. Doom is Doom. That's you. Uh, you'd have to. Re you if you want to fuck up Doom, go right ahead. But I don't think you're prepared for what had happened. Well, we saw what happened last time Bethesda tried to interfere with it in Doom Eternal. Mm -hmm. that, oh, uh, we're that, that lasted what for a week. <laughs> yeah, and then it was like, nope, roll that back, and then gave uh, Bethesda a giant middle finger, saying, "Don't ever do that again." Mm -hmm. So. Next, oh boy, <laughs> Miura, why well, you got to be playing with my emotions? <laughs> I saw this announcement, and I, the very first thing I ever thought to myself was, "Bullshit, he's gonna still play Idol Master." <laughs> yes. <laughs> so supposedly, some some new beginning is teased for October 9th. And just an announcement. It's not even. It's not even an actual, like chapter or anything. It's just an announcement. Mm -hmm. And exactly, exactly what the what this is going to entail is not sta is not stated. And the website shows, vi even though the still on this tweet only shows images from the golden from. Uh, I'd say the Golden Age and a little bit of the Black Swordsman. Um, well, the, one of the paintings is from the Gorge, um, the new, the last chapter that went on uh, when the hiatus started again in July. Yeah, but the um, the different images just go th go throughout the different ages of um, of the of the manga, and this is in. It wasn't a few, it wasn't but a few months ago that there was an announcement of that sp of that spin-off involving a certain dragon-shaped apostle which was a weird choice if anything. <sighs> but in other news, so one of the artists for Do for Dr. Stone is doing is doing his own spin-off, namely a spin-off of One Piece. Focused on Ace. Okay, um, you're gonna have more more information about this than I will. Uh, One Piece is not my cup of tea. I uh, I've been very vocal about it in the past. I don't know if I've been vocal about it on the Gazette or anything, but to me, One Piece is a shonen anime with a comedy anime for a protagonist dead. Luffy does not feel like any shonen anime protagonist at all, ever. His, his, he's too flippant and too... It, it's, it's almost mood death to me. Um, and, uh, would you... Would that's you... Why um, when... With that, with that in mind, I'm cu I'm curious if I'm curious if you if you'd be if you how you'd end up how you'd end up taking um, 
Ace since he's Luffy's older brother. Well, kind of. Is he more serious? Yeah, I'd given given the fact that given the fact that he was he was one he was one of the top officers in on um, Whitebeard's ship. Yes. Okay. That might be an interesting story to read. the The problem is, I think I'd still have to read the original story for context. And the bigger the bigger problem that I'm having, we already know how Ace's story ends. He dies. Yeah, that's why. That's why there's the. That's why there's the problem. <sighs> I mean. Maybe I'll give I'll give it a I might give it a passing look to see what a different artist would do, would do with it. Well, if it's if it's Boichi, um, it's it, it's certainly going to be very striking art. His art is very very cool. Yeah. I love Boichi's art. So at the very at the very least, maybe I'll maybe I'll take a look just for the art. But um, don't expect a glowing review. Speaking of which, ladies and gentlemen, we are in hell. What? No! No! Stop! Yep, we're getting another SAO season. Debuts uh. November 6th, 2022. So, okay, we've got some time. <laughs> its story is still written by Reki Kawahara. It will still be shit. This is probably based on the SAO Progressive Light Novel by Reki, um, which apparently is telling the story of SAO from the beginning, um, but um, put but puts more but puts more details. It's a glorified reboot. Did we really need the Brotherhood treatment this fucking early? Wait, what? What? But what? 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 So I'm just gonna take this moment to plug uh, Sword Art Online abridged, um, <laughs> just so that we can clean everybody's palate here. <laughs> they actually just recently released a new episode for season two. Um, it was hilarious. So ignore this horse shit and go watch them. Go watch them repeatedly. They deserve it. Look, they, they let, I will. I will end this by saying. Look on the look on the bright side. There's no need to wonder where your God is, because He's right <laughs> here, and He's fresh out of mercy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sword Art Online works works a lot easier when you assume that Kirito is just psychotic. But the only reason he's psychotic is because of his psychotic half sister slash cousin. So, meanwhile, um, this would be a case where I'd play the Hose Mad song if my soundboard worked. <laughs> <laughs> An Australian bookshop has decided to stop stocking Rowling's novels, including Harry Potter, in order to create a safer space. Bitch, you're in Australia. There is no such thing as a safer space. You're right. They only make the spaces more dangerous by removing the ability of your people to, to defend themselves. How are you yeah. going to win the second emu war, Australia? You lost the first one. Specific, specific. It's on. It's another. It's another thing on this whole. This whole lengthy thing of J.K. Rowling is 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 trans is transphobic. So let's ban. So let's ban all her stuff. Um. First off, all, first off, do you really think you're a? You want to know what I find really funny about this whole controversy? The same people who who would laugh, who were laughing at um, NFL fans for burning jerseys during the whole kneeling controversy, are burning her books. Burning books makes them more like Nazis than burning jerseys does. I saw a similar thing where people were laughing at um, the bur the burning of um, char Chargers jerseys, but as far as I'm concerned, they were completely justified in that. <laughs> Because Dean Sp Dean Spanos, who had been who who um oh, who owned the Chargers, which had been in San which had been in San Diego for about for oh, over fifty years, 
decided to, decided to throw the whole city under the bus just so he could move them to L.A. I'd say that's a justified reason to, to start torching some shit. Yeah, and so long as it's their own shit, so long as they aren't, you know, stealing it from stores and burning it, um, <laughs> go nuts. You're the one who spent the money. <laughs> yeah. Um, and when when it comes to, when it comes to this this sort of thing, um, you realize you the other thing I have to the other thing I have to note is um. You realize you just get you just gave um you just you you just gave money to other bookstores, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in, or, in order to create a in order to create a safer space, um. Yeah, um, let me know. Let me know how well. Let me know how well that's go. That's going when you're out. When you're out in the Australian wilderness again. Look, she's not. Rowling's not going to be hurt. Rowling's not going to be hurting for money. And um, do I find this more or less retarded than the people who are who are um? Who I find okay. Let me rephrase that. I find this slightly less retarded than the people who are boycotting the um, upcoming video game simply be, simply because of Ra simply because of Rowling's politics. But here's here's the big secret. Most of the people reading. Most of the people who were who were reading Harry Potter when they grew up probably don't give a shit about about Rowling's politics. Did Zana? Let me posit yeah. this: Did you you probably read Ender's Game at one point, didn't you? Oh yeah. Did at any point did you give a shit about Orson Scott Card's politics? No. I was more interested in the story I was reading. If if the story I was reading had been about his politics, then I would have had to have an intrinsic interest in his politics because it would have been in the direct subject. Did but, you did you ever did you ever care about the about um what particular faith um Tolkien had? No. Nor that of C.S. Lewis, though I know that you know in some cases it helped shape their their storytelling methods. They weren't for example, shoving it down my throat in a way that I would have found distasteful in the books. Mm -hmm. So going over to C.S. Lewis and, and Narnia, because it very clearly has many uh, biblical ties, um, just because it, it's somewhat religiously inspired doesn't make it a religious story. And... It's really well told. Plus, he did some some great stuff with things like the screw tape letters. So, Wormwood. <laughs> I just I this whole I I don't want to consume that media because their politics are bad. I look at people like that, and I go, Can you tell the difference between what's real and what's not? I don't make I don't I don't make Bible quotes often, but there's one that I think very much applies here. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. You know, one time I threw a rock when someone said that to me. <laughs> and the, and they and they're like, "But you've sinned." I'm like, "I'm not part of your religion and don't believe in anything like sin." So, by definition, I haven't but the sole, <laughs> the sole reason I'm using that quote is because if you if you dig deep enough you're going to find you're going to find you're going to find something you disagree with with ev with everybody. Everybody's got some sort of some sort of skeleton in their closet in one form or another. So yep. trying to go for this sort of moral purity is um like like a piss hole in a snowbank. Yep. But moving past that, um this is a graphic novel I might actually read. <laughs> I, the Rumble actually, in the Jungle is getting made into a graphic novel. Nice. I did want to make one final statement before we did move on from the, the non-troversy, though. Um, that bookstore might be getting in trouble for their non-troversy. There's a small section in that, in that article that says that the store claims Rowling chose one of her pseudonyms, Robert Galbraith, in honor of Robert Galbraith Heath, a psychologist who developed, who helped develop conversion therapy, which 
when on the official website for that that uh, pseudonym, she chose the alter ego name from of Robert by conflating the name of her political hero, Robert F. Kennedy, and her childhood fantasy name, Ella Galbraith. If enough people believe this statement from the store about her name coming from Robert Galbraith Heath, a psychologist who developed conversion therapy, it's going to damage her reputation in a way that damages her uh, her livelihood. And that's enough for a defamation case in most places. Be interesting how that worked how that work out in Australian law, but um I don't know a lot about Australian law. I can only come from the US side of things. But now it's now to better things. So Titan yeah. Comics is gonna be adapting the Rumble in the Jungle fight into a graphic novel titled Um Muhammad Ali, Kinshasa, 1974. And it's be it's being written by Jean David Morvan, who's previously written Wolverine, and drawn by Raphael Matisse Ortiz. Um, apparently, they're teaming with photojournalist Abbas to to include rarely seen as well as behind the scenes photographs and first hand accounts from the fight. It's like it'll be fun. Mm-hmm. And... I hope that uh, Muhammad Ali uh, uh, enjoys it. I mean, the man. The man doesn't have much to enjoy these days. Um, the graphic novel will also include photos from Abbas's personal archives that he's kept for 36 years. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And um, I like this cover. I like this cover art here, mm-hmm. where it's showing uh, Ollie throwing a punch. Yeah, that's just a really nice pose. That's really well done. I like the I like the composition of that drawing. Pretty much. Um, apparent apparently, the project had been discussed with the Tribune content agency, detailing that the project was a long time in the works. Explained, it's a long story because Rafa was not the first designer approached for this project. Besides, I didn't yet know him when we set this album in motion. But the designer who started had to stop for personal reasons, and Rafa finally took his place after a few months. I had written the script without including the photos, so Rafa, in his storyboard, decided where to place them. They became integrated naturally. That's nice. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's going to be in hardcover sometime in February of next year, and will retail for about 30 bucks. I'd buy it. Mm-hmm. I'd like to read this. It's just a it's a historical story, and it looks like it's drawn really well, and it has those actual historical photos interspersed. That's just a that's that's a really nice touch. Like you said, it became integrated naturally into the into the actual flow of the comic. I really like that. Yeah, um, I don't agree with art with the first comment here saying that if you saying that if you want a backstory, just watch the documentary When We Were Kings. I don't like the idea of just one documentary being the end all be all for a, for a given event because sometimes you can do this from multiple perspectives, and the idea of doing it in a graphic novel version is going to be tell is going to be telling a different story than that documentary. I'm not slagging it, but I'm saying I don't want that to be the only way you um, cover backstory. Yeah, and in When We Were Kings, it that's not the only fight shown. That documentary covers a lot of Ali, not just one fight. <clears throat> I... I find a statement like that to be, oh, this is just, I don't like comics, or I don't like that they're turning this into a comic, so it shouldn't be. That's that's what a comment. That's what a comment like that reads to me. Yeah. Then, although there there is um there is one thing that I that I'd like to see kind of put into the back, even though it probably wouldn't be apropos for something like this. Mm-hmm. Um. Get one. Get one of the artists behind. Get. Get one of the artists behind, say, Ch- Champion Joe or Hajime no Ippo to do his own rendition of Ali. 
Oh man. Probably wouldn't happen, but let me dream. Yeah. So I'd next see from oh, Hajime. Mm-hmm. I'd want to see it from Hajime no, Hajime no Ippo, mm-hmm. to be uh, perfectly honest. Like Ashita no Joe uh, is a is a great comic, but Hajime no Ippo would be super fun. Yeah. Um, so next, I'm surprised this is still going on. <laughs> Battlestar Galactica Deadlock is still around. I haven't touched this in years. But this is the finale for season two. Apparently. The. What the. Huh? Only season two? Slytherin what? is not known for being fast on things. I'll put it that way. I. I just. Clearly, and clearly they're not really good about keeping things hyped. So I haven't heard about this game in... I haven't heard about this game since the show last, since the show wrapped up. I, I was about to say I don't remember. I honestly cannot remember the last time I heard about this game. Mm-hmm. I know I did. I just don't know when. Which, incidentally, if some if somebody watching this hasn't seen Battlestar Galactica, as, as far as the um, rebooted version that was um, written by Ron Moore, go do that. I know I know some hardcores of the original series hate it, but um, they can go c- kiss my black ass. Remember, Jim trolled Dwight by saying that the new Battlestar Galactica is a shot-for-shot remake of the old. Don't be like Dwight. So next, now we've talked about a couple of times the um, Inuyasha spinoff Yasha, Yashahime. Mm-hmm. Well, we now have a release date. October 3rd. Um, simulcast in both North and Latin America with English subs. A dub is expected shortly after the simulcast. And it'll be on Crunchyroll, Funimation, and Hulu. Uh, <laughs> okay. So that's going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not gonna be. Ju- I'm not gonna be chomping at the bit for it. But if I if I get if I got time, which I which I don't have a whole lot of these days, I might take a look. What yeah. I'm more likely to be taking a look at is th- is this. Our Last Crusade or The Rise of a New World. His and Hers. A oh. anime about two nations at war with the main characters being from rival sides. One side technology, the other side witches. It's Romeo and Juliet. It's the Montagues and the Capulets. It's the, it's West Side Story. The Jets and the Sharks all over again. At the very, at the very least, I, at the very least, I'm not, um, I'm not, st- I'm not sticking to comforts. Let's say. Yeah. It's an interesting premise. Mm-hmm. I mean, tech versus magic. As as the uh, backdrop for what is essentially again the Montagues versus the Capulets. Well, given given how that given how that given how that ended up being a a a fixture with one of my fit with one of my favorite Universal Century series, that being um, <clears throat> um, du- no, it was it wasn't double it wasn't double O eighty it was the eighth MS team what was what the hell am I thinking? I don't know what were you thinking. Clearly, I wasn't, but yeah, I like the Eighth MS team. Eighth MS team is a good series. Mm-hmm. Good, good little bit of the UC. Plus, let's be honest. If I was running a Gundam campaign, that's how I'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see you doing that. 
Plus, there was that little, there was that little thing in an in a um anime hell where so, where somebody um reshot it to do to do the um opening theme to the A team, and it worked so well. <laughs> And yeah, as far as this one is going, this is going to be coming to Japan on October 7th and will be broadcast in the States on um, Funimation. Um, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't say who the uh, studio is. I'm uh, not sure. But uh, the the reason you were probably thinking 0080 is because of uh, it had another specialized Gundam of Gundam Alex. Yeah, although um, it also had Mikhail being drunk. And it also had one of the best Xeon mobile suits ever, the Comfer. <laughs> that chain mine is fucking genius, and I love it. So uh, next, well, prepare for salt, because Uzaki Where? is getting a second season. Where's our salt foreman when you need him? <laughs> Already the hoes are getting mad. Hose mad, hose mad. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, a second seat, the second season adapting the manga is is coming around. Um, and uh, and obviously it's it's inevitable that it's gonna, that it's going to be coming to stateside. I did. I did take a look at a clip from the from the dub of Uzaki, and um, let me just state that whoever picked Monica Rial for 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 Uzaki in this was um, not thinking. Yeah, they were pretty stupid. Because um, this is not me. This is not me. Drum, this is not me drumming up controversies. It's just that she's doing the Bulma voice. Uzaki is not Bulma. No, not not even not even slightest. Um, what could they not get Tara Strong to come around? Because <laughs> that that's immediately who I would have cast personally. Mm. I don't very, know. At the very least, you can get away with some pitch, given the fact that Tara Strong apparently apparently has a stash of helium somewhere. I like her, but you but you know the rules. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so the other one that I'm not entirely sure if I'd go into it, but maybe I'll maybe I'll use it to torture cure is assault lily bouquet. <laughs> I can see why you would use it to torture cure. Yep. Um. Well, we, apparently this is coming to us from a Zone International. As a transmedia project about a group of girls who protect humanity from monsters, the the uh, monsters known as Huge H U G E. Um, you are huge. That must mean you have huge guts. <laughs> Rip and tear. Rip and tear your guts. <laughs> um, certain women known as Lily have powers known known as Charm that allows humanity to fight back against the Huge. They are trained in gardens. And um, am I the only one who's who's re who's reading this synopsis and thinking, is this my Hime all over again? Uh, <laughs> I I can't um I can't I can't deny can't deny. And of course, I, of course, I have to wonder. I have to wonder why their magic has to involve runes, including a rune for the weird. Because it's mystic and impressive. Yeah. So, um. Also, when when I look at the art, when I look at the art style in this key art, um, there's a small part of me that that has to wonder if somebody was taking notes from Senran. Maybe it's, maybe it's the color palette. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not getting too big of a Senran vibe from it, but... 
Oh, also, of course, we had a. Of course, we're dealing with a plethora of oversized weapons, as you do. If anything, the the the. I'm gonna. I'm about to out myself here, but uh, the impression this gives me is love life, not uh, Zenron. I'd say that I'd say that's a bit more that's a bit more apropos. Um, <laughs> either either just, way, it's either way, it still qualifies as torture material, because because I, I can I can rub it in his, I can rub this in Kira's face. I can, sorry, Kira, I can, you know the rules. <laughs> I can literally hear these girls fighting and killing the huge. All while singing Snow Halation. I can literally see that in my head right now. And that's enough for that. <laughs> and we're walking, we're walking. So, it looks like we're getting a third Momodora game. That's apparently going to conclude that story arc. Third? Don't you mean fifth? <laughs> yeah, fifth. What the, what the hell was I saying? Um... <laughs> the new game and teaser were released to celebrate the series' 10th anniversary, but um, but, deta but um, details haven't been confirmed. So all we have is just this little teaser that's only going for about a minute. So, I'll keep an eye out. We did get, now. Um, a good chunk of the TGS stuff happened after the deadline, but there was one entry that managed to get a little bit ahead, and that's the TGS trailer for Monster Hunter Rise. Uh, my hype only gets more uh, hyped. There's only more hype for me. The mm -hmm. hype is reaching the infinite plane. <laughs> it'd probably be a case where it'd be too, it'd be dangerously high if uh, in for um for some for somebody like C. I was gonna make a CV11 j joke about his hype levels being too high when it came to Doom Eternal, so he had to reduce it by playing a capstone game. But that eh, joke's lost. Um. Some of some of this is def was actually this is the same trailer we saw last week. So let me scroll past that. Um, I did a bit of the of the live stream recording. Um, I'll have to look into stories too as well, but there's probably not a whole lot to go on when it comes to that. Uh, the most we know from what we saw at TGS is that the main character of Stories 2 is a descendant of a legendary writer named Red and his Rathalos named Ratha, who don't actually have any relation to the Red and Ratha from the actual Stories 1 game. They aren't related, but they have the same names. Uh -huh. um, and that the the Wyvarian girl Enna is, much, is likely much older than she appears because Wyvarians age really weirdly. And uh, that's how she knew Red and Ratha when they were... But when, uh, Red was still alive. Mm -hmm. Now, next we have what I what I am calling Konami's at Konami's attempt to do the apology tour. Now this is this is what I call. Oh shit! We're almost out of money. Hurry, print some more. Yeah. So Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid, MGS2 Substance. And the Konami Collector series Castlevania and Contra are now on GOG. Yep. The only qu but I do have to ask one question: If you're putting all this stuff on GOG, why are you not putting Metal Gear Two on? I mean, because they're dumb. I'm hoping that it's done later, but I, I'm not going to accept the excuse of it would be hard to port. You already ported it for the, for um, subsistence. Maybe that's... Maybe... They are...
going to release it later when they release the rest of the Metal Gear games, maybe. Yeah. Um, although it, although I would be, I would be really pissed off if the uh, Metal Gear game that Metal Gear um, that they ended up putting out was the NES version. <laughs> In fact, let let's let's double check. Um, yeah, I think I. Th- judging by the screenshots, I. Th- I think this is the MSX version. Yeah, this looks like the Master System. Ma- ma- Master System version. Like um, MSX isn't a, MSX isn't the master system. Okay, my brain's not all here. The Pardon the me. MSX was a was a PC was a um, PC yeah. engine console that yeah. that was um, a proprietary thing for Konami. Yeah, I remember. I, my brain's ignore 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 the man behind the curtain. So we'll. S- the very le- the very least it's only six bucks. Um, I I hope that this leads them to put Metal Gear Solid Five on GOG, because then I can download it DRM free, and they can never take it away from me. So then we have this case of Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Transformers Battlegrounds, which I only just found out about. Apparently, they're, apparently they're trying to go with a skir- with a skirmish strategy game. Um, Why? Yeah, that's the question that I'm having throughout this whole thing. Why? 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 Why didn't they just approach Platinum again and get a follow up to the first Transformers game Platinum made, which was actually really goddamn good. No, this is basically Transformers XCOM. God no. Nope. 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 XCOM betrays you. Nope. It's already on the nope list. Nope. <laughs> I don't I don't know if it's going to be as unfair as that, but I'm lo- but I'm looking at the um I'm look looking at the gameplay I have in, I have in front of me. Um The big question that I have is, what what would be the what's the point of do, what's the point of doing um, vehicle mode in a uh, game setup like this? And okay, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. When I when I initially heard about this, I was dreading that this was going to be some um, mobile only thing. But to be honest, okay. it kind of looks like a mobile game. And I'm guessing they're hoping that they can get some multi some multiplayer with things like capture the flag, horde, last stand. What are these uh, doing in a turn based game? Don't you know? You can still capture the flag in a turn based game. In case the sarcasm wasn't obvious enough. <laughs> Not. Not no, I think I think you need to make it a little more blatant. <laughs> but our our Can last totally entry, our last <laughs> entry, is the fact that Granzella has announced the release window for R Type Final Two, which was a crowdfunded shoot 'em up sequel to um well R Type Final. The it is. R- in Famitsu, it was confirmed that it is coming out sometime in spring 2021. R-Type is just one of those games you look at and you go, man, I remember when Gradius clones were really popular. I I like me I like me some rail shooters, so maybe I'll get maybe I'll give this a look. I mean, it's, it's been a wrong. it's been a while since I it's been a while since I've dived into an R type. Um, I think the I think the I'm trying to th- I'm trying to think if there's any um if there's any rail shooters that I've ne- that I've never been a fan of. The only one I can think of is I think Darius is I think Darius was kind of meh. Um, 
I was going to say something about 1947, but I can't be too harsh on that because that was my first. And remember, it was designed primarily as an arcade game. I mean, they all were initially, but. Yeah. Um, I think the, I think, I honest, I honestly think the one that I've been the, that been the least fond of over the years, as blasphemous as this is going to sound, is Gradius. Gradius didn't really do anything new when it won after its after its whole option system was explored. It never moved beyond that. It rested on its laurels when it shouldn't have. And i i think I think what definitely didn't hurt definitely didn't help is I've seen ripoffs take the option system and run with it in other ways. Yeah, and they've expanded upon it and made it innovative and changed up how it works and it makes a an entirely new game and yeah like like i said gradius was good it was great it was a very well designed game with a very cool change to the normal shmup uh formula but then it didn't do anything different it just continued doing what it knew worked which kind of explains how konami does most of their stuff not all of it but most of it which leads me to wonder, even um, even if there weren't all the complications with MGS5, Kojima probably would have been shown the door anyways, simply simply because simply because of being simply because of the fact that they wanted more conformity. Simply because of the fact that he changed his games literally every time he made them. Oh, that too. <laughs> the thing that makes me saddest about Kojima leaving Konami does not have to do with Metal Gear Solid 5. What makes me saddest is there was a time I remember the announcement being made for it. And things seemed to be going well. And then we were told we would no longer be getting Zone of the Enders 3. Yeah, that was a stinger, which, um... Out of... Still out, of not pure, a out of pure curiosity, did you ever play The Fist of Mars? Yes. Yes, I did. Which was basically our um, gateway drug into Super Robot Wars. <laughs> For most people, yeah, because it, it's one of the few uh, turn turn uh, turn based strategy games with giant robots that came to the U.S. For me, I was playing Super Robot Wars back in the PlayStation One era, which means I was playing um, unpatched ISOs with no translations. I didn't understand the story. I just loved. The 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 uh, absolutely fantastic for the time animations and the voice acting and it was just mm, so tasty. Um, I'm still sad that we don't tend to get Super Robot Wars in the U.S. because of the licensing situations. But Sony was smart before they transferred everything over to California in making the PlayStation 4 region free. So is Nintendo. Because now I can order the Southeast Asia versions of these games, which are translated into English because that's the most prevalent uh, language in Southeast Asia when you're considering all consolidated languages. Because each what you know, each country may ha may have its own nat like a for example, uh, Tagalog mm -hmm. in the Philippines, but the Philippines only makes a part of Southeast Asia, so everybody speaks English in Southeast Asia. Um Sure, the editing is not the best, and the translations sometimes have a little bit to be desired, but I can understand my commands, I can get the gist of the story, and I still get to play my game. What's not to love? Pretty much. But that is, that is going to do it for this edition of the Gazette. We will, be, we will of course, be back here um, next week. Next week. I hope that in a few days I will have the Savage Kingdoms third edition review. Um, Mike, if you're watching this, um, don't um, don't expect any special treatment because I don't give it to anybody. I don't give special treatment to anybody. And what? And um, of course, tomorrow we have the Brotherhood effect on Geek Watch. 
So that so that's something to look so that's something to look forward to. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>